So China's courts are too strict, borderline draconian. But South Korea faces a different problem, that of being too lenient. Let me explain. A court in Seoul handed out a surprise verdict today. It acquitted Samsung's top boss, Lee Jae-yong. Now, the case dates back to 2015. Lee merged two Samsung affiliates, Samsung C&T and Chiel Industries. But the merger was not squeaky clean. Prosecutors said the deal was done to strengthen Lee's position. They said he cooked the books. But today he's been let off. It's a big relief for Lee because the 2015 merger was like his kryptonite. The same case got him jailed in 2017. Back then, the charges were different. Lee was accused of bribing the former South Korean president. Her name was Park Gwyn Hai. Lee offered her $6.4 million. In return, he wanted government approval for this merger. Lee was sentenced to five years in jail. But 18 months later, he was out. In 2021, he was arrested again. Same case, different charges. And once again, he was sentenced to prison. But months later, Lee walked out on parole. And one year later, the South Korean president pardoned him. If this isn't fishy, I don't know what is. One man, one dirty merger, many convictions, but somehow he escapes all of it. The question is how? To understand that, we must understand Samsung. For you and me, it's just a company. But in South Korea, it's a lot more. Samsung and its affiliates make up 20% of South Korea's stock exchange. 18% of the entire GDP and 17% of total exports. I know the numbers are impressive, but Samsung's influence goes beyond statistics. Name any industry, chances are Samsung is part of it. Hospitals, medical centers, schools, textiles, electronics, universities, construction, insurance. Samsung has its fingers in all of these pies. As a result, you cannot escape Samsung if you live in South Korea. It's not just another company, it's part of your daily life. But how did Samsung reach this position? The story begins in 1938. Samsung started out as a grocery trading store. It was founded by this man, Lee Byung Chul. Samsung would produce noodles and export them to China. That was their first business. But the Korean War changed everything. South Korea was devastated by the fighting, so the country had to be rebuilt. And Lee jumped at the opportunity. From the late 1950s, he went on a buying spree. Lee bought three commercial banks, a cement company, a fertilizer firm, an insurance company, textile mills, a department store, and an oil refinery. South Korea's policies helped Lee do all of this. Back then, the regime was protectionist. It wanted to help South Korean businesses grow, to shield them from outside competition. Such businesses have a name in Korea. They're called Chebol, basically large family-owned businesses. And Samsung was one of them. By the late 1960s, Lee ventured into the world of electronics. His first product, black and white televisions. Then came an aerospace division then information technology, then telecommunications and nanotechnology. So Samsung was rising fast. By 1987, Lee passed away. The company was split into five. Lee's eldest son got the electronics division. His name was Lee Kun Hee. Now Lee Jr. brought in a big attitude change. He once told his employees, change everything but your wife and kids. And for a while it worked. Product quality improved. The bottom line was looking good. But beneath all that was a toxic corporate culture. For example, bribing was a big problem. In 1996, Lee himself was charged. He bribed the then president of South Korea. His son did the same in 2015. But both father and son were pardoned. And through all of this, Samsung kept growing. Today, it's a corporate giant. Until last year, it was the biggest smartphone maker in the world, even ahead of Apple which is also why Samsung bosses get away with almost everything. You see, South Korea is eyeing the chip race. It wants a chunk of the semiconductor market, and for that, it needs Samsung. It needs Lee Jae Young at the top. Is it an ideal situation? Of course not. It is the definition of state capture and crony capitalism, but South Korea has no one to blame. They chose this path to growth. 
Now they must deal with the consequences.